of the Infrastructure Committee and hand over to Councillor Denison. Kia ora koutou. Thank you, Councillor Udakiri, our Deputy Mayor. I'll now open the Infrastructure Committee meeting of the 3rd of June and just do some housekeeping um, before we start. We have, I'll just read through some bullet points that are the safety procedures for this building. The male and female toilets are located on the ground floor and the first floor of this venue. There is an independent disability toilet on each floor as well and disability access stalls in the main toilets. All entries and exits are through the front doors of the venue only to enable contract tracing to be fully captured. Unless there is an emergency evacuation, please refrain from using any of the exit doors other than the front. Please ensure you maintain appropriate physical distancing measures um, from your fellow attendees and make use of the sanitising stations uh, that are located in the foyer and the reception areas of this venue. The Palmerston North Conference and Function Centre is a non-smoking facility. Our first aid kit is available in the main office. A defibrillator is available on the ground floor next to the unisex toilets. Please make yourself aware of the positions of the emergency exits and the procedures are displayed at the exit points. In case of an emergency, uh, follow your nearest marked exit door and the assembly point will be at the front lawn of the, of the building. A safety warden and venue staff will be on site to assist with this process. Thank you. We have no remote members attending, but um, understand there'll be some officers and they may be required to answer questions and we'll give allowance for that. Uh, but otherwise, I'll call for apologies. There being none. Uh, item two, notification of additional items. I have no notification to share. Item three, declarations of interest. There being none. Item four is public comment and we have none being advised. Thank you. Uh, and so therefore item five is a presentation from NZTA and it's my pleasure to invite to share with us today Mr Lonnie Dalziel uh, uh, who is the owner interfa interface manager and Mark Long uh, who is also Te Ahu uh, Tu Ranga Alliance People and Culture Manager from NZTA. Welcome gentlemen. I look forward to you sharing about your significant project. Kia ora koutou everyone. Uh, Ko Lonnie Dalzau tōku ingoa. Um, thank you Councillor Denison. Um, I hope you don't mind, am I allowed to stand up? Or? Yes you yeah. are, feel free. I'm, I'm still getting used to seeing people in real life, so bear with me. It's been a while since I actually presented. Um, so thank you very much for having us here. It's, uh, it, it's good to get invited to um, meetings such as this, with, which is related to infrastructure, pretty much 100% of my life. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm the owner interface manager from Waka Kotahi, uh, NZTA, and I work with the Te Ahua Turanga Alliance. Um, I'll just get Mark to introduce himself. Te Ahua Mauri Ora, ko Mark Long toku ingoa, ko Orua toku awa. My name is Mark Long, I'm uh, a Rongatea boy. Uh, I am really delighted to have had the opportunity to come back to the Manawatu for this project. Um, and I get the privilege to deal with our most important assets, our people on this project, uh, which we'll talk about shortly. Uh, so today was an opportunity for us to do a bit of an introduction for Te Aho Turanga. Um, I'm sure we all know about it, um, but probably what we're more interested in doing is a little bit of Q&A, which I think we'll do after our presentation, because um, probably us understanding what you're interested in the project allows us to answer your questions. So our presentation is more just a bit of an introduction, um, and then we'll have the opportunity to answer any of your questions uh, post the presentation. Uh, we're just going to share throughout it. Um, normally, I would say feel free to interrupt and and ask questions during, um, but I think we're a bit more structured here. I'm impressed by the structure, actually. I was just saying up there, I feel a little bit informal sitting up there, so um, appreciate it. Uh, so what we're going to just cover off is the, the simply the why, the who, the what, the how, and the when. So the why. Um, we'll all know Manawatu Gorge um, 
has played a significant part of probably everyone in this room's lives. Uh, I get the opportunity to visit a lot of people and everyone has a story about the gorge. Uh, unfortunately, in 2017, after the uh, Anzac Day slips, uh, it was ultimately decided that the gorge was going to be closed indefinitely. So we're here to discuss the new route, which is the one called Te Ahua Tūranga. Ultimately, the investment objectives for this piece of infrastructure from NZTA point of view is to provide a new road that is safe. Um, many of us know the old road was not the safest of roads. Uh, a resilient road, so one that's not closing all of the time. So we have that connection maintains, the important east to west connection. Uh, and it's an efficient road. Now, when we established these transport objectives, they were uh, in a previous government and efficiency was a key word. But what efficiency means is guaranteed travel time. So between Woodville and Ashurst, you'll know exactly how long it's going to take you, whereas we knew it was a bit hit and miss previously. Uh, earlier on in the piece, we uh, actually went out to the community and talked about what's important. And two key words kept coming up, and that was reconnection and enhancement. So reconnecting east to west, Ashurst, Woodville, the affected communities, uh, Iwi to alienated land, uh, so land they haven't been on for a long time, but also reconnecting with Te Apiri, which has been lost uh, because of the shut. So making sure we celebrate what Te Apiri was. Enhancing was talking about the environment, the history, uh, the economic opportunities that come with a project such as this. So the who? Te Ahua Turang Reliance is a conglomerate of five key organisations and five key local iwi partners. Uh, we have Fulton Hogan, WSP, Waka Kutahi, New Zealand Transport Agency, Oricon and Heb Construction. Our two main contractors are Fulton Hogan and Heb Construction to a 50% partnership. And our five iwi partners are Rangatane or Manawatu, Rangatane or Tamaki Nui Arua, Ngati Kahungunu, Ki Tamaki Nui Arua, Ngati Kofata, and Ngati Raukawa each of which have a place on each of which our five alliance partners and our iwi partners have a place on our board and embedded within our organization key people in our structure is mark evans our project director um, who has led significant um, and large scale national projects um, of the size we have tony adams as our construction manager who's recently successfully opened uh, the huntley bypass damien mcgann uh, who has worked on puhoi to walkworth he's our planning manager and Tim Waterson, who was instrumental in NECTA um, in Kaikoura. So the tricky thing we have is we've only got 10 minutes to talk. We could, I could talk probably for days on this project, but uh, rather than us continually talk, we actually might just chuck a video up there, which um, a few people will have seen previously, but it's a virtual flyover of the project. And I'll rather than going through the design slide, maybe I'll just do a bit of narrative while we look at it, um, which might help explain so this is available online as well just under the project web page uh, if you if you do come along to the uh, community days or the information sessions uh, we usually have an updated version of these uh, this one was updated for our community sessions that we started in march um, they got cut short due to covid 19 unfortunately uh, but we'll be going to do a new session of it we roughly do them every four to six months so some of the key features, the Wellington, Ga uh, the Western Gateway roundabout is at this end, at the Ashus end. And this is just going through some of the key ones. So the Gateway Park is, we're working with the Palmerston North City uh, Reserves team and the cycle team to make sure that links with a lot of the visions of Palmerston North City. Uh, the viewing area, you know, we talked about celebrating Te Apiti. That viewing area on this new bridge is going to make sure people still celebrate the history of it. Um, going over to bridge three, it's a 300 plus metre bridge, which is specifically there to minimise the impact on a significant environmental area. Uh, and we are going to be using it as an enhancement area. So it is going to be an area where there's walkways and cycleways through. So running up the hill from Ashurst towards Woodville, as you can see the four lanes going up the hill, but the alignment pushes as far north as we can to minimise the impact on the QE2 covenant but that means there's a 55 metre cut up the top of that ridge there. Uh, the other thing with that northern alignment is that it avoided all meridian turbines, so we didn't ha have to remove any of the turbines up through the Te Apiti wind farm. 
Um, going down onto the other side of the hill, that was the uh, eastern roundabout, which is the gateway from the Woodville side. This is the uh, person driving along at about 250 k's an hour. <laughs> so if you excuse that aspect of it. Um, but one of, the, one of the key features as a safety aspect was the um, four laning or the crawler lanes extends the majority of the road goes down to uh, one lane in each direction for the roundabouts or the sh threshold treatments. Uh, and it's got wire wrap barriers, uh, the three barrier systems, so along the centre and along both edges for the entire route. So that's the big 55 metre cut there. Um, one thing that probably threw our investigation up in this area, uh, it turns out this is actually one of the most seismically active areas in New Zealand which I'm not sure everyone knows about, but we experienced that in the last couple of weeks. As I, my house certainly shook last Monday when that uh, earthquake hit. Um, but one of the reasons why that's significant is we actually removed one of the bridges up in that area. Uh, so minimizing bridges and seismic areas are pretty high priority, but all the other bridges are designed will be some of the most seismically resistant bridges that we've ever constructed. Uh, even more, even more though than Transmission Gully, which we all thought was pretty bad. So the uh, bridges, when there's a major earthquake, the bridges will still be standing, but potentially nothing else will be. So that's that's one of the more interesting aspects of the project. Going down the other side into Woodville, there's a 35 meter cut, and it heads down. Probably, um, oh, probably the other key aspect of it is you see on the left hand side, the shared use path has been added to this one. That was something that was done through the designation process. We are down to our last minute. Um, I might just pass on to Mark. He might just cover off a few of the social outcomes, which is a, a, another new aspect of the project. Gentlemen, I'm happy to extend up to another five minutes for you to cover well um, your points you wanted to present. And then we'll, ex we'll extend uh, questions thereafter. I'll be guided by the traffic lights for the extension. We appreciate it. Um, as Lonnie alluded to, engagement has been really um, a key fundamental principle of what we're trying to achieve. Our engagement with the community li liaison group, our engagement with the Palmerston North City Council, um, our engagement with local communities, um, specifically Woodville and Ashurst, uh, has allowed us to make a really effective um, uh, shared use path along the entire route of the, uh, of the road. Uh, and we believe and, and we understand that that will create a significant um, and more positive impact of what this road is going to do. It's beautiful. If you if we haven't been out there, we we will be aiming to get as much as many photos and videos from the landscape as we go throughout the next three and a half years um, to keep people engaged. We want this to be built by locals. We want locals to be affiliated with it. We want locals to own it um, and be able to drive it and know that they've they've seen this be um, built over the over the time. Social outcomes also is something that we are um, leading the charge with on this project. The first is a locals, a locals first employment approach. We want local people to build this road. We may need to, um, to pull in and uh, allow other people to come into the Manawatu to get the road started. But even if we do need to pull in a large workforce from outside of the region, we will be upskilling local workers through a mentorship and development program in order to do that. We do have a time frame to get this done, but we do also know that to, to allow the community to have the capability and the capacity to do projects like this in the future, which I know you're all aware of, the, the significant investment over the next 10 years, that's really important as a legacy for our project. Housing is also important if we are pulling in resource from outside of the area. We want to minimise our impact on the local housing market. We know there's a shortage of rentals. We know there's a shortage of houses, um, both being built and for sale. So we want to minimise our impact through that and we've proactively, we've proactively started that process already. Um, and opportunities for Māori and local businesses. We want to spend as much in, of, of the investment for this project as we can locally. So we are going to be actively working with local businesses on their current capacity and on their future anticipated capacity and to see where we can support them in building that. So there is a continued legacy of improved, of improved capability within the Manawatu Tauranga region. And so Mark previously touched on uh, our iwi partners within the project. So we've embarked on a slightly different approach um, underpinned by the principles of Te Tiriti or Waitangi around uh, partnership, protection, participation and people. Uh, we've got representation uh, of our iwi partners 
on the operational side of the alliance, the management part of the alliance, and the governance, as Mark previously talked about. Um, we're working extremely closely, and probably why that's important is because it's challenging what has been done in a BAU kind of process. So it's challenging how we've done things for the past 20 years around um, EWI not being a stakeholder. They're actually a partner. They've got um, decision-making and input into the project right from the beginning. Um, and it is something new. Um, it is something that some of the TAs and regional councils were working with um, to try and, and, and show that the, the partnership approach has wide-ranging benefits. Uh, the how. So we'll, we'll cover off probably not the phasing. Um, we're into the consenting process there at the moment. Uh, we have received the designation, um, which is the through the territorial authorities, and the regional consent was lodged and has been notified. And we've gone to the Environment Court for a expedited process with a hearing date expected on the 24th of August. So we're just working through submissions and uh, expert uh, conferencing at the moment. We also have to do a series of enabling works. So to allow us to, um, I guess, minimize time frame or achieve our December 24th completion date, we need to undertake a range of enabling works this year, starting in October. So there's a range of separate consents being lodged with the regional council to allow us to get those underway. Um, all of these are in trying to get the road open as quick as possible to try and you know, minimize that effect to all our affected communities. Uh, all going well with our consenting process. And I say that because we all have been through consenting processes and it sometimes does bring up the unknowns, but we're confident that we can start our main works in January next year. So it's a bit of the scope of consents, regional consents are mostly related to what we're actually doing on site. So your earthworks, um, the effects on stream, uh, and dust. Uh, you'll have potentially have seen the documentation that was lodged. It was seven volumes over two and a half thousand pages. A bit of light bedtime reading if you are interested. So uh, probably just to touch on Mark's engagement aspect as well, when we get into the earthworks and the main works, um, there'll be opportunity to take people out on site. One thing we do realize with Greenfield's projects is that there's only points of contact. So there'll be opportunity to take people like yourselves out there to actually show you what's going on. Um, so just keep that in mind in the future if you're interested in actually uh, visiting site. So just to cover off the program, I've briefly touched on it, but consenting this year, looking to start enabling works in October, so only a few months away, with main work starting January 21, with a target completion date of December 24th. So open for questions. Thank you, gentlemen. Um, just indicate with your hands, I can see a start already. Councillor Beatty, Councillor Rutherford, and then Councillor Johnson. Okay. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you both for the update. It was great. Um, you mentioned housing and minimising the impact. Would you be able to expand a, a little bit on that, please? Happy to. What we want to do, uh, this is the first time something like this has been attempted, so our approach currently is working with local developers on shovel-ready developments that aren't currently in the market. So we are, we are providing, we're, we're asking local developers to, to come to us if they have a, um, a consent or a building that's starting to be built and we will buy that off them in advance. It's not part of um, what the local market currently has, so that's one way that we're looking to minimise our impact. So, if I may. Yes, please. So are you encouraging new build or buying existing we're, we're encouraging new build okay. so some of these are existing some of them are new some of them potentially wouldn't have been started without our investment okay thank you Everybody. Well, just part of the tendering process um I, I worked on a previous project transmission gully and the impact some major projects have on the uh, rental the uh, the property market in general uh, so we actually wrote into the tendering documentation that we want to minimize that impact and so the strategy mark's talking about it's, it's a strategy we're going to implement over the next few years, but it is going to be staged. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Rutherford. Um, the first uh, is around housing as well. Um, so just to clarify, um, I think you just said that 
you are working with um, developers who already have a consent for a build, and that's when you're going to, um, I guess, arrange a um, sale then. So that's our current priority. Over time, we hope to, and we will be working with Iwi on developments they currently have. What we need now is to immediately minimise our impact, knowing that our workforce is going to be starting to come in September, October. What we are doing now is getting houses that are ready to be built, and over time, we'll be, we will be supporting developments that are, I guess, not yet shovel ready, but in the planning pipeline. Okay, so I guess um, from a from my my perspective, if a consent is already issued, then we would already count that as a upcoming house within sort of the stock of Palmerston North. So, is that not still taking from the the stock rather than building your own? Do you know what I mean? Like, if if we've already counted it, so we think, okay, we've got a hundred houses coming up to, um, you know, ease a bit of pressure, but actually, that's already tagged for sale to. NZTA for your workforce, what what's happening to sort of alleviate that? The minimising factor we have is that we are hoping to speed those up. So we're hoping to have those houses built faster so that those developers can build other houses faster. Okay. Um, and when you said that you, um, around being proactive with housing and you've already started, what, what specifically has already started? Is it just those conversations or is there other work that has already started? We have five houses um, under negotiation currently. Okay, cool. Um, and then just in regards to general timeline for the project as a whole, when will people be driving on the road? Are you waiting for 100% completion or partial completion? When, when will we actually see sort of vehicles on the road? The construction program is an evolving thing. We're currently saying the project completion, so vehicles on the road December 24. If we can enable the road to be opened while planting still being done, we will look at that. But currently the date you'd have to go with would be December 24. And with, um, with the December 24 date, is that, a, um, is that a date that's been worked out in terms of um, practically, if, if everything goes to plan, or is that uh, is is that factoring in a bit of time where there could be some delays? Oh, you always have to factor in float. Um, major infrastructure projects, especially ones like this, r rely on a lot of weather. Um, you know, earthworks projects like this. So this is three years of earthworks. This this project uh, assume wet weather days. Um, so if it is more than that. It, you know, we have to recover that time. If it's less than that, it might finish early. So it, it is a, a little, little bit of a best guess at the moment. And but it's pretty realistic. And it, it's very realistic, yeah. So we, we account for weather days, um, productivities of vehicles. Uh, if things get behind, or we just have to look at ways of accelerating by increasing productivity or extending construction project. Yeah. So December 24 date is our date, and, and we'll be doing everything we can to achieve that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Johnson. Uh, thanks, Mr Chair. Um, thanks for your presentation. Um, I've got a couple of questions about housing and then one about the training uh, that you've got planned. So for the housing, um, I know you've answered some questions on that already, but in terms of numbers of people that you're thinking to bring into the area who will need housing for the duration of the project, can you give us an indication of um, numbers and timing of those numbers? And we're, we're currently working on requiring 55 houses um, for people that we're bringing into the area. And that's based on a 65% local employment um, ratio, which we believe is realistic for the start. Um, if we work on 90%, we require 22 houses. Um, and any, of course, everywhere in between. Our priority is for a local workforce, but we'll need to work with the Central Region Skills Hub and other local organisations to see how realistic that is. Okay, thank you. So in terms of the training then, um, are you intending that you would be working with, um, say, um, the Polytechnic and local training providers for people to do pre-apprenticeships and then them to come into the project to do their apprenticeships? Or how are you um, intending for that training to, to tie in with what's offered already? Sure. So we have 20 apprenticeship um, places on the project for the, for the life of it. And we anticipate 75% of those people will finish their apprenticeship, apprenticeship as a result of being involved in the project. Um, we will work with every organisation locally that we can to ensure that people are being upskilled and trained. 
we're still getting, or well, I'm still getting my head around the um, government changes to ITOs and, and what's going on. And once we once we know that, we'll be able to more clearly identify what that relationship looks like. Okay, thanks very much. Thank you, Councillor Butt. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, gentlemen, for your presentation. First of my uh, question has already been answered about housing. The second one, this local first employment idea. Which of the five partners put this idea, number one? Number two, by local employment, do you mean only the workforce working with the shovels and, and driving the cars or people already working on, I mean, on, on, on the top side? Are they included in this policy or, or can you tell me how many of the current people working on the project are local? There's a few questions in there. I think the, the first very short answer is all roles uh, are, antici are anticipated to be local roles. What we need to do though is understand the current capability of people who are job searching in the, in the Manawatu market. Um, po our post COVID-19 world is going to be um, different, of course. What we're working with local organisations is to understand cross crediting of their current um, experiences and how they can fit within the requirements that we have on certain roles. If they cross over, our preference is to employ local people first. Noting that we've just we've said that we want to be finished by December 2024, we will be likely employing more out of town uh, experts for the start, with an intention to cross that over and have a have a mainly and priority local workforce to finish off, and as quickly as possible. Thank you, Mr. Thank Chair. That. Councillor Barrett. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and. Likewise, thank you, gentlemen, for the presentation and appreciated uh, the updates. Just a couple questions from me. Um, the first one's around Te Apiti and, and access to the walking tracks. It's you know it's it's probably our most popular recreational destination already, and there's inevitably going to be some conflict there, I imagine, around getting this built and keeping um, access to the walking tracks. Just can you help us understand what's being done to minimize that conflict and, and help keep access into that area? Yeah, no problem. Nice to see you as well. Um, there's the obviously the main access to that is from the existing Gorge car park area. Uh, so there's a temporary car park being built up on the plateau, um, just up on Tom Shannon's property there. And there's actually a viewing platform also going to be created up there so people can see what's going on. Uh, so that's going to completely separate the public away from the construction area. From that car park, there'll be an access down to tap into where the existing access into the walking trail is. So at all times, there'll be maintained access to the uh, walking track and, and a car park. Excellent. Really heartened to hear that. Thanks. Um, the other question I had was just around, um, I guess, what's being done to ensure construction quality and I guess what's sitting in the back of my mind is is everyone being mightily impressed around the Kapiti Expressway when it opened up and then being mightily surprised when it had to be dug up about six to 12 months later and just you know what's what's being done around quality assurance on the build? Uh, it's a really good question and, uh, and obviously there's been a, a few issues with pavements around the country from a Waka Kotahi point of view. Um, so the level of quality assurance on this project is, is actually taking a, a, a bit of a step change we're using Osroads Part 5, which is a higher level of quality assurance using independent verifiers um, than has been done previously, probably equivalent to what was done on Transmission Gully, but for all aspects of the project, not just Earthworks. Uh, we're also doing a client base, so an NZTA uh, payment design, and so not looking for the alliance to actually skim down on the design and the payment profile. So we've specified it, we've designed it, um, at a probably a slightly higher level than would be expected for a, a, a road that's, you know, eight to 12,000 vehicles a day by the time we get down 20 years. Um, so all of those will lead to a, a higher quality, um, but the quality assurance comes under that, you know, kind of that step change in, in process and verification. Great. Thank you both. And Mr. Thank Chair. Thank you. Councillor Harpeter. Thanks very much, Mark and Lonnie. It was a great presentation. Um, just a question about the wind farm. Um, I noticed from the video presentation that there was a lot of the wind farm in it. I just wondered if any of them were being moved or shifted. No, so the northern alignment that we 
made during the tendering process avoided the two turbines that were look at being affected. Uh, working with Tiapiti, so this will be the first live highway that goes through a active wind farm. So it's quite unique in that space. Um, we do get within 160 metres of three turbines, um, which requires additional geotech work, but no turbines are being moved. We do cut through four uh, cables and access tracks. So part of the works is actually re-establishing and reconnecting all of the turbines so Meridian can maintain a 24-7 operation. So a lot of work's being done and will continue to be done with Meridian, um, but no infrastructure, no turbines are coming down, but we do affect some of their cabling and access tracks. So are we breaking a contract with, or are you breaking a contract with Meridian on our behalf, or is anything happening with that contract? I'm not sure what you mean by contract, but our, our, our impact, we're, we're looking to mitigate any losses. So that is doing things like uh, laying the cable and only having a day down on a turbine. And if we can uh, align it so that it's a scheduled maintenance stop for one of the turbines, that's the type of thing we're looking at doing. So we minimise that impact and any downtime of the turbines. I think you've answered the question. Thank you. Okay, no problem. Thank you. I just had a question uh, from the chair in regards to the total value of this project. I know that there's earlier figures of price bands, but can you just confirm what the what the overall budget is for this investment? So the current publicised figure is 620 million. That's total project. So that's the construction, property purchase, investigation, all of those costs figure into that one. The construction is roughly around 500 million, I think. It's we're still just finalising the top, but it'll be around about that. Thank you. But yeah, overall project value is 620. Thank you. Just um, scanning to see if there's any further questions from members. There isn't. Thank you, gentlemen. I'd, um, there may be some comments that members might like to make, but uh, um, feel free to stay and you can um, and listen in on, on any of that. Oh, we really appreciate getting the opportunity to come and talk about our project. Um, and if you want us back at any stage to give an update, not a problem. Great. We might take you up on that offer. Thank you very much, Lonnie. Thank you, Mark. Uh, councillors, I'm happy to move that the committee receive the presentation for information, seconded by Councillor Beatty. Open it up for any comments uh, that members may like to make. Uh, Mr Mayor. Thank you, Mr Chair. Thanks, Lonnie. Thanks, Mark. Great to uh, to finally get the, our, our update. Um, I know it's been a few months in, in getting here, so we, we appreciate that. I um, just want to acknowledge that... Um, Although it is a it is a connector to uh, Ashurst and Woodville, and no disrespect to our our, our villages uh, either side of Te Apiti, um, and they certainly are the gateways. It's a much bigger project than that. It actually is connecting uh, the west coast or, or central North Island over to the east coast, and it is a it is a road uh, or highway of um, I would say um, significance for the nation. Uh, not only moving people and goods, but also freight and export goods. Uh, to various ports. So just want to acknowledge um, the scale of it. Um, interesting to hear the figures of 620 million. Um, that along with the other projects happening in the region of around three to four billion um, just emphasizes the amount of work that's going on. Just want to comment about the local aspect. So the word local was used a lot and I think that's uh, again significant. Um, in the past and even at Kapiti, um, a workforce was sort of brought in and then, and then leaves. So if we can get some legacy value on this for our city in terms of contractors, um, uh, workforce, um, upskilling some of our own people, um, I think that's a real positive. So um, um, there's only good going to come out of this. So we appreciate um, Transport Agency, um, the presentation, and um, I can't wait for it to start. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I too, um it's quite impressive, isn't it, hearing 620 million? It's a, it's a large sum and most largely going to be a uh, benefit for uh, Palmer South, Wider Manal 2, Tararua, quite significantly. And like the Mayor, also recognised our distribution linkage and uh, the, the time and channel that this will create uh, to our Eastern friends uh, is, is very significant and uh, has national um, significance equally. Um, I love the fact that you've got the high engagement and even that viewing platform I wasn't aware of as much 
that you'll have that to get access to uh, the walkways that exist and recreation that's well appreciated. Um, but just to see the progress of, of this project um, being undertaken um, is a great aspect. Likewise, with the opportunity to um, have site visits that you um, are encouraging um, throughout the project. So thank you for coming in. And like the Mayor mentioned, we had you lined up prior to COVID, uh, the meeting date, which we had to um, cancel. Uh, but thank you for your flexibility to come in this morning. We have some other comment. Councillor Johnson. Thanks, Mr Chair. Um, I just wanted to comment on the um, positive social aspects that have been included in this project. So, you know, we, we think of these infrastructure projects often in terms of, you know, what they can achieve um, in terms of the money that they're bringing in, but um, it's not uh, common for us to hear uh, a separate aspect where the social elements of a project have been considered in such a thorough way. So I'd just like to commend you on that. Um, I think you could tell from the questioning that there's some concern about our housing uh, capacity here in the district. And so it's really good to hear that you're on top of that and uh, also that you'll be working to, in fact, leave us with greater capacity at the end of the project than we started with. So pleased to hear that. And also the element of um, providing apprenticeships um, and encouraging training, which I think is um, to be commended. So uh, just um, whilst I hear that, you know, the lovely big sums of money and the um, super lovely highway that's going to be constructed, I also see their positive social benefits will be good. So thank you for that aspect. Just checking no further comments. Thank you, councillors. I will now recommendation. All those in favour say aye. 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 Against. That's carried. Thank you, gentlemen. You can feel free um, to make your way out. That moves us on to the minutes uh, to approve for from the 4th of March. I'm happy to move. Seconded by Councillor Beatty. Any matters arising? Or I'll put the minutes be approved as um, a true and correct record. All those in favour say aye. 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 Against? Carried. Thank you. That moves us on to the Papaoya six month update. Um, and welcome, Bryce, isn't it, to the table? Thank you, Bryce. Uh, good morning, councillors. Um, pleased to say the um, stage two of Papioia Place is um, actually running ahead of schedule by three weeks, which is fantastic. Um, and not really a heck of a lot more to um, to contribute other than that, other than um, we've actually been nominated for stage one for the Western Architectural Awards um, for um, the social housing category. Um, so I attended the, um, we've made the grand final, which is fantastic in that category. So I um, attended that virtual meeting um, a couple of weeks ago and contributed to some of the social aspects and things like that that sort of get missed when you're just talking about architecture. Um, so happy to keep everyone uh, in the loop as soon as we hear the results of that. Other than that, I'll consider the paper read. Thank you, Bryce. Open up for questions, Councillor Johnson. Thanks, Mr Chair. Thanks, Bryce. Um, so the stage two that's going to be delivered in two portions, can you say how many units are in each stage, 5A and 5B, and then... Portion six. Uh, yes, um, so 5A and 5B are nine units each, and then across the road in portion six, um, that is another 10. So 28 total on stage two. Okay, yeah, thank you. Um, and in terms of the changes that have been made to the design that are mentioned in the paper, um, do you have a map or a diagram that you could send us of that? Because um, it's hard to visualize just from the description. Uh, yep, certainly can. Um, I'll circulate that after this. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Bryce. It's great recognition around that um, stage one being nominated for that award. Um, I had a question regarding the green space within the complex and knowing when we did the opening back in February, I think uh, was the date, uh, there was conversations and I've had heard the murmurs already around the community hall and wanted to explore whether or not the Papaoya Sports Pavilion 
uh, that's basically used just to store some corner flags and nets for the goal post. Been a possibility to create a, a community space for those residents. Is it has it been considered in any of your um, scope? Uh, it has been considered um, and um, still needs to be a bit more investigation work to be done into that. Um, but definitely it is something we could consider freeing up that green space for, um, I, I guess, some other options in terms of a stage three of Pavia area. Can I understand leading up um, into the LTP next year that that would be part of the scope of if there's going to be more houses in that green space or left open? Because one of the proposals earlier was to uh, create a community space, but I just want to make sure that you will do an undertaking to consider that um, sports pavilion as part of a community space option. Yep, definitely will. And um, yes, I do envision that um, a discussion around scope of a stage three um, forming part of the LTV. Great, thank you, Bryce. No further questions. I'll move uh, that the update won't need to go too far, of course, Bryce, because you're up next. Um, seconder, Councillor Rutherford. Um, any comments? Thank you. That's uh, there is none. All those in favour, say aye. aye. Against, carried. Thank you, councillors. Can I welcome you back to the table for the arena six monthly update? Thank you, Bryce. Good morning again. Um, Yep, so Arena's uh, underway now, which is fantastic. Um, so uh, the head contractor took over the site on the 5th of May. Um, they had a whole bunch of site establishment works that they needed to be getting into um, and currently are just finalising the demolition um, and starting some of the earthworks. So pleased to say uh, everything is on track at this stage um, and continuing to progress as planned. Great. Was, it, um, was there a follow-through with the images from the construction work to date from our stakeholder meeting? Uh, yes, uh, I, I don't have them with me here, but I'll, I'll happy to circulate um, the photos after this. Yeah, um, it was discussed um, just last week, actually, uh, the presentation of some pictures that were done with the early construction work, which are really pleasing, uh, and but also is the heritage, cultural and heritage elements that have been developed, which are um, pretty well integrated uh, and used throughout the, the um, plaza entranceway. Sasha, did you want to make some comment on that? But we'll make them available informally. But yeah, that's um, being moved to the um, Arts, Culture and Heritage uh, Committee meeting just to align with the, um, I guess, the, the concept um, that's being produced. So that um, that will get presented then and then circulated from there. Okay, that's pleasing. Okay. That's been followed up. Thank you for that update. Any other questions? Councillor Hancock. Yeah, Bryce, uh, thanks. Uh, just a point of uh, clarification, um, page 20, um, stage two there, that second bullet point is, uh, can you just clarify the date there for us, please? Uh, apologies, um, 2021. We're, we're, we're good, but we're not that good. <laughs> <laughs> I understand that the South Grandstand was part of our package for that shovel ready proposal that central government pursued. And I understand, does that, can somebody give us an update if we've heard back, if that's made it to the next round of evaluation? The South Grandstand, I understand, was part of our shovel ready project. So I just wondered if we've had an update around the next stage of evaluation. Uh, no, we haven't. We know that it was, um, that it was put forward that all our uh, projects have been successful in terms of being recommended. That then goes to um, cabinet, and there are, I think, two or three ministers that are that are leading that decision making process. We are yet to hear back, but the the arena grandstand was one of those. Yes, thank you. No further questions. Thank you, Bryce. Thank you. Move again, seconded, uh, Councillor Bowen. Uh, open it up for any comments or debate. There being none, all those in favour say aye. 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 Against, carried. Thank you, Bryce. Moves us on to our transport network update. Welcome, Robert.
Good morning, councillors. I uh, think for the virtual audience, uh, Robert Van Bentham, Manager Transport and Infrastructure, and joining me is Chris Lai, my Senior Transport Engineer. So, look, just a few uh, brief uh, opening comments about this report. So, this is a new um, initiative of ours, really, and the intention is to provide council with a regular six-month update on both actions and progress towards improving safety for all users of the transport network. We've looked to capture the key elements of Council's investments and, and initiatives in improving safety, including the sort of proactive auditing that we do, the network crash analysis that's been captured with our work with NZTA, and also the more minor safety level of service improvements that, that councillors have certainly been supporting. So the third thing I'd like to say is there's a bit of a change going on at the moment in terms of the way that NZTA, our key funder, is uh, funding and supporting safety projects. You'll be aware of the global, uh, sorry, the um, government um, policy statement and the Road to Zero initiative. So as part of that, we've been working closely with NZTA to secure a new agreed funding line, as all TAs have been doing, for a, an approved program of safety inventions across the network. Um, as part of what's called the safety network program. So there's a number of, you know, billions of dollars over a number of years. So we're in the, we're in the middle of that process and, and hoping to get sort of confirmation for that work. And I suppose the final element I just want to allude to is, you know, we, we put the action plan in at the end um, as a way of allowing us to track and report back to you on the various initiatives underway. The intention is, you know, we're looking to improve safety and we would like to keep uh, coming back to you with updates on, on that um, regularly. So really, that's really all I want to say. So we're open for questions. Thank you very much. Councillor Harpeter. Thanks, Mr Chair. Thanks, Robert. Um, just really on Napier Road, any update from NZTA on where we're up to with Napier Road? Uh, all, all I can say is that You'll be aware, of course, that Napier Road and any improvements there are a NCTA responsibility, 100% funded by the, the agency. It is also um, now in the safety network program process. So uh, we uh, we believe that, you know, it rates fairly highly within that process, but it needs to go through the same, um, yeah, selection criteria and, and, and prioritisation. So we're hopeful that it, uh, may be advanced in the next uh, year or two, but no no definite commitment at this stage. So do we need to have more fatalities to have more progress? Well, it's a little unfortunate, but yeah, it, it, it certainly the analysis that's been done on all of these safety projects is possibly a little dated. So one would hope there might be an opportunity to update that uh, analysis to bring in the more recent fatalities. Uh, but yet it's a, it's a function of all safety projects that uh, they have their time and unfortunately in the meantime we've had a few more, as you say, um, fatalities. I'll just call on the GM's indicator I'd like to add. Certainly we've had ongoing dialogue with NZTA and we've reiterated the relative importance of the safety measures at Napier Road and we've highlighted the fatalities and the accidents. So we're going to continue to push. Um, we're also going to push at multiple levels. But again, you know, we don't control the process. We just feed into the process. Thank you. Councillor Harbert, are you OK? Thank you. Mr Mayor. Mine was along the same lines, and I appreciate the officers aren't really in control of the situation. I'll, I'll, I'll leave it to comment. Thank okay. you. OK. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Councillor Johnson. Uh, thanks, Mr Chair. Um, thanks, Robert and Chris. Um, so I just want to ask about the available funding for the minor safety upgrade. So in 4.2.1, you've said that the available funding is usually insufficient. And uh, that is when we have the normal amount of funding. But um, subject to ratification next month, there's been a big cut to that budget that was put forward in Appendix D, from my recollection, um, and not debated individually. The whole appendix was accepted. So I just wonder if you could talk about the consequences of the significant cut to that budget and what we might be able to achieve in terms of road safety over the next year. The the change in, I suppose, focus with NCTA means that 
Um, traditionally, a lot of our safety initiatives have come under what we call the low cost, low risk, and some of those have also fallen into the minor safety area. So we are actually hoping that through this safety network program, uh, we'll get a separate line of funding around safety, um, which will be more consistent and will be you know, uh, an annual uh, allocation, which we will not need to, as it were, seek additional approval for. So we're hoping then that historically, the mining safety program has had to deal with some of those more significant safety improvements. Now they'll be under a separate funding stream. So um, yes, there are still a large number and, and we, we allude to a um, prioritization tool that we've developed, um, which are focused around you know, uh, pedestrian improvements, uh, roundabout improvements, um, you know, intersection changes, and those, uh, many of those are not necessarily aligning with the safety crash analysis. So they're about improving level of service across the network. There hasn't necessarily been, you know, isolated crashes in those locations. So, and there's also a wish from the community, as um, as we're aware, that you know we're looking at traffic calming, slowing of traffic in some parts of the city as well. So. I think what we're envisaging is the minor safety program will refocus towards those uh, smaller, um, you know, level of service type initiatives. Now, generally, uh, those are low cost. We can generally do a few more of those with the budget. Um, so I think we will find that the budget will go a little bit further. I mean, this year, for instance, we're spending half a million dollars on the, so the um, signal, sorry, the uh, barrier arm uh, safety mm -hmm. treatment for, for the key rail crossing. So essentially we only had 300,000 this year anyway to spend on minor work. So it looks like for next year's budget, we will have some carry forward, um, possibly maybe 100,000. The indicative budget we have allocated reduced to as a couple of hundred thousand next year. So yes, there will be a, a significant reduction, but we do believe we can still get a meaningful number of um, improvements implemented. Um, clearly, if we had more money, we could do more. Um, but, you know, it's essentially we'll be using our prioritization, prioritization tool, as it were, to pick those with the most merit. Um, so um, possibly that doesn't answer the question, but clearly if, if council is able, you know, going forward to increase that budget, we could increase the number of, uh, you know, those minor safety treatments. But I suppose what, what I'm saying is that it's the safety investment I think will increase over time as a result of the new the new program lines. So, uh, which should help some of the pressure on 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 safety. Investment. Thank you. There are further um, questions. Do you it's have another just one? It's just a follow up from that. Yep. You're um, happy to. Sorry. Thank you. So, in terms of the, uh, where well, you're talking about the uh, additional annual allocation, that's from NZTA, is it that you're referring to? No. Well, we would need to match that. So council would still need to match that. It'd be a separate program line that would have to start in the next uh, LTP period. So. So you'll be putting that forward for the next LTP. We will. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. That, that clarifies that. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Barrett. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Robert and Chris, for the report. It was um, quite a pleasant surprise, actually. I think it, it shows a level of sort of integration and and um, visibility that, that is really um, appreciated. So I'd start with, I guess, that framing and just trying to understand, you know, have we have we turned a corner and is there sort of other aspects of transport reporting that, that we might expect? Because this is quite heavily in the safety sort of lens. Um, there's other lenses that we might put across transport and just wondering, have you got a wider sort of reporting framework that you're considering or is where does this fit into the overall picture? I think it's fair to say that safety still dominates many of the investment drivers, certainly from the agency. And if you look at the GPS, uh, that is clearly a key focus. Um, I think what we thought was there were a number of programs across council's portfolio that were around protecting users. And we thought it was a way of bringing those, uh, those outcomes together. Um, but no, we're, we're certainly open to looking at, um, you know, packaging up other ways of looking at the, the network, potentially looking at uh, capacity uh, in terms of, uh, um, you know, 
both for uh, you know, say freight, but also vehicles. So understanding a little bit more about congestion across the network and 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 some of those factors and what might might. But it, essentially, I suppose we would say that the network is fairly fixed. So you know we're not looking at extensive investments uh, in in you know additional roading connections other than the you know the sort of regional uh, picture. So where we're trying to understand is is how can we best spend our money to achieve efficient transport but also safe outcomes. So I suppose maybe there's a corollary report as you suggest around uh, transport efficiency and 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 whether those some of those things are starting to show up. But um, uh, generally our network is actually very porous. There's lots of options for people to move around the network, so we don't see a lot of, uh, of pressure, uh, although that's starting to occur at some times of the day and, and you know, in some parts of the network. So, cool. but I yeah, no, on, happy to happy to respond. Can I call on the GM also wants to make some comment on this question. So, so this report really is an attempt to kind of provide a bit more transparency, a bit more you know like visibility on on the safety issues around the network. It's very safety centric. And for a number of reasons, one, as Robert says, that aligns with the, the GPS from NZTA. Equally, it is really important, right? We see it as probably the key driver. So, but if 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 people wish, if you wish us to augment this report further with other lenses, then we're obviously we're happy to do that. Great, thank you um, both for those for those responses. Um, I guess the second question that, that this report raised for me is sort of the the pedestrian improvement side of things and we and we're pretty heavily focused on getting our footpaths to a smoother standard which is understandable um, but I guess sort of just thinking about the where we've gotten to with the the urban cycle network and sort of actually articulating a, a forward vision about how that's going to be um, developed and and provided to the community and and thinking about some of the constraints, I suppose, in the pedestrian network that aren't just the cracks in the footpaths, so the getting across streets, the, you know, the actual safety sort of elements of that as well. Would there be, I guess, from an officer's perspective, would there be value in articulating sort of a, a pedestrian network development plan vision that's sort of analogous to the, to the cycle one that could help the community see where we're going and why? Yeah, absolutely. Um, we, we have been doing some preliminary work on on something called a roads and streets framework, which is actually about looking at the nature of all of the um, the road corridors and places within the city, and understanding that each of them have an element of place as well as an element of transport function. Um, so. Uh, the intention of that is to develop that further with some case study work around some of the key key parts of the city, and potentially bring that back to councillors later in, later in the year as a as a way of, uh, you know, then clarifying what we want some of those areas to look like in terms of the physical infrastructure, but also the importance to be given to them as place, and connectivity, and and I think I mean the probably the the point. Just a bit, a little bit hidden in the report. If you look at the pedestrian accident statistics, they they tend to dance around a lot. I mean, they're relatively small in number. They're relatively random across the network. So, um, if we tried to chase the statistics, uh, you know, we would have you know be a relatively poor outcome. So instead, the approach is much more about asking, what is the level of connectivity? How you know where do we need have better quality connections and crossings for pedestrians. Clearly, we're going to be focused on those areas with higher pedestrian counts, pedestrian movement, but also there might be principles around our network which say that for major arterials, we want to have safe cross crossing places every, you know, 200 metres. Um, you know, at roundabouts, there needs to be, you know, um, islands or, or... So building a set of principles which we can then overlay across the entire network and gradually roll out. So um, so I think, yes, we, we're more than happy to come, come back to Council and we're, we're doing some work in the background about um, re-envisaging our transport system as actually a series of places as well as 
corridors on which people live, um, you know, and and you know walk and recreate and and move about as well as you know. Um, so I think that's that's an important change. I think, yeah. So yeah. Thanks. Uh, third and final question, if I might, Mr. Chair. Sure. Um, was was just um, the the report. Um, you know, had quite a, a numbers and sort of engineering flavor to it um, and and just was trying to understand where the sort of the, the people and behavior sort of element fits fits into this. I know that, you know, road safety as a as a function sits with the regional um, regional um, council. But, you know, you're talking about sort of auditing different components, you know, auditing the crossings, auditing the intersections, et cetera. Um, and just sort of wondering about auditing the people, because sometimes I sort of think that, you know, maybe people being on their cell phones might be one of the dominant factors rather than necessarily the, the design side of things. And how are we grappling with that issue? It's, it's quite hard to find um, those specific issues. A lot of the crashes are categorized. Um, there, there is, I guess, um, certain categories that you can look at, such as affected by alcohol, um, but maybe not necessarily cell phones at the moment. Um, it's uh, it is usually done by a location basis rather than a network as a whole. But um, I guess those could be looked into for the next report um, a bit more specifically and look into the wider issues. Um, as well. Right, we're ha happy with that. Council, we have several questions, on, and I'm just mindful of getting through the business. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Chair, Thank for you. the opportunity. Some of these some of these questions are, are moving into some of the planning and strategy elements. Um, and if you and we can talk about the scope of this report if we want more elements reported back to us on um, we can add them but um, that's just comment to help with some of the questioning uh, councillor dingwell thank you thank you mr chair and thank you gentlemen for this report uh, as a new councillor it's actually been quite handy to have this overview of, of exactly where we are at um, in terms of our um, in terms of this. Uh, I did have a question on page 47 around the, uh, sorry, just finding here, implement, uh, sorry, pedestrian improvement initiatives, implement enhanced footpath renewal program of work. Um, it says in there that um, there was allocation of the surplus budget from the vehicle crossing renewals. And I was just wanting to understand a little bit around how you end up with a surplus budget for vehicle crossing renewals and what would have happened if you know, there wasn't a surplus budget there like, um, and, and sort of how much that is because it says, yeah, so just a bit, if you're able to elaborate on that one a little. Yeah, certainly. Uh, there's a separate council approved budget to replace damaged vehicle crossings. Um, so a council renews those as and when required. So generally uh, it's, it's difficult to predict what the level of uh, investment will be required. There's some condition information, but it's limited. So this year we've identified that actually we had a surplus. Um, so uh, as there was an opportunity, NZTA have approved a significantly higher level of funding for footpath renewals than council had approved. So we were able to allocate some of that money uh, to the footpath renewal budget and uh, take advantage of that additional subsidy, some subsidy money. So. We had not expected to be able to do as much work as we had. We had the lockdown. We thought we'd, you know, we wouldn't achieve that. But uh, the contractors have done really well, and we've managed to, um, you know, get some more work done. So, I mean, that's essentially the opportunity we've taken. Wonderful. Um, and so, and so, if we hadn't had that surplus budget, would that mean that there would just be a lot more footpaths that wouldn't have been renewed during this period? We would have simply stopped work and then start restarted next year with a new budget. Ah, okay. Very good. Thank you for that. Thank you. Councillor Naylor, followed by Councillor Hancock and Bowen, and then we'll round up questions. Thank you, Mr Chair, um, and, and thanks, Robert and Chris. Um, just looking at the crash data on page 37 and 38, um, and, and obviously the narrative around the fact that it's um, the fatal and serious injury crashes have trended upwards with, it, with a, the last year being higher than the, any of the last 10 years. Um, along the lines, similar lines to Councillor Barrett, I was going to ask if um, we had any understanding of 
whether alcohol was a contributing factor to any of those crashes. Is, I mean, I understand that NZTA must collect that data. Is that something that council looks at as well when they're looking at the crash data? Um, not specifically, but um, generally we also need to consider in terms of the road safety, the, the road environment and the contributes. Uh, how the contributing factors to the accidents from that. So um, while alcohol can be um, an, an um, something of an influence, um, it, there's still other elements that need to be considered in what was happening. Um. Okay, thank you. So um, just to follow that up, in 3.2.2 .2 on page 40, you've t it's said that the um, causes of the crashes can, wild, uh, can vary wildly and can often be influenced by other factors unrelated to the network design and condition. Um, and Mr Chair, you indicated something about the questions being more planning and strategy. Yep, I can get uh, the GM to kind of lead on as a follow on from that comment if I could. I guess what I was going to ask is, is there a further report that comes to planning and strategy that's diff that uh, um, addresses different issues to this report? Or Perhaps in, to, to bring a differentiation to it. Um, mm. Can I ask Jim to make comment on where you um, so might sit? Robert did talk about the, the roads and street framework that we're, we're working on, which essentially has a more kind of holistic view of how the various transport nodes talk to each other, cannibalise each other, interact with each other. Um, we see that piece of work ultimately coming back to the, the strategy, Planning and Strategy Committee, as opposed to here. Was that helpful? I guess that um, I'm not sure if that would answer the if that report would answer the question I have or not, but I'm happy to, happy to leave that for today in the interest of time. Um, it was more around whether we have an understanding if the data is increasing. So I think in answering your question, in essence, we've, we've, we've said in that paragraph that there are a number of other factors outside our sphere of influence that can be behavioural, can be a number of different things. Um, have we done any analysis on the breakdown of those factors now? Have we have we isolated the individual causational factors and then put action plans in place to to address them? No, is that the next piece of work? Probably. Okay, that that's right. good. Thank you. I do have a couple of other questions, Please if that's okay. Yeah. Um, page forty three. Um, the prioritisation tool, um, uh, four point two point three. Has that prioritisation tool that's being developed has it been applied yet to the program of work? Um, yes, we'll be looking to try and apply it to next financial year's pro projects, um, mainly um, towards the pedestrian improvements that we're looking at. So we've identified a, um, a list of projects that we'll look to do pedestrian improvements, and then we'll also be looking to do a local road project through that through this tool as well. Okay. And just one further question um, on page 45, 5.1.3, regarding the Monrad Street um, improvements. So the speed indicator devices in the traffic islands that have been installed, has that resulted in um, the improvements that were sought and um, is the roundabout still a recommended part of that picture in terms of the priori prioritisation tool? Um, in terms of the speed indicator devices, the speeds have been um, relatively the same. Um, not much of an improvement there. Um, and the islands have had um, some better compliance and much, uh, ideally it's, uh, there's been a visual change to the, the intersection, which has had um, some improvement and some positive comments. And, and the second part of that question was, so is the roundabout still recommended from officers? You remember, Councillor, that that was a political decision. Uh, it wasn't actually advised by the officers. So, um, and since then, I understand each corner of a, of the properties has been negotiated to allow for the land to create the the parcel so well down the track. So, I think the point I, I want to make is that was a political decision, not one that was recommended by the officers at the time. I understand that, but since that, it seems that some of the improvements have been implemented. So, I was un interested to understand whether that had addressed the problem. Happy for an answer. Uh, there's really no change to uh, to the officer's assessment. There's been no um, 
if anything, there's been an improvement in the behavior uh, of drivers through that intersection as a result of those temporary treatments. Uh, but we are still implementing the roundabout. So. And so what I, I guess I'm trying to understand is the still the outstanding part of that being the roundabout, where that sits in, the, in terms of applying the prioritization tool to the work program. That sits outside that um, process, yeah. The prioritization tool is really being used to uh, examine uh, areas around pedestrian safety, um, minor intersection improvements. So that's uh, you know, separate. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Hancock. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr Chair. Uh, my question is just really around um, uh, the uh, the use of data. Um, and uh, I assume that we are um, pretty much uh, solely reliable, uh, sorry, re relying on um, NZTA and the CARES database. Uh, for our data, so I just really want to know um, what's the uh, what's the usual gap between the time of an event, uh, time of analysis, and subsequent reporting, and are there any limitations in terms of uh, our responsiveness to uh, those matters of risk? Thank you. The data is generally within the database within a couple of weeks, so there's usually you know two to three week lag. Um, I mean, we track the data to understand the general change in safety risk across the network. Um, unless there are very particular incidents that occur that highlight a, a safety issue. So um, we are not driving the program around the broad safety uh, outcomes. However, as described, NZTA and ourselves were collaborating on, on this uh, safety program of work. That uses the CAS data in combination with network um, connectivity and other factors to develop a risk score. So it is but one of the factors that we look at. Thank you, Councillor Bowen. Thank you, Mr Chair. Um, two elements to this question. I think, gentlemen, thank you for your report. Um, first, just to note that this is a transport network report. So my question is about the interaction with the rail corridor through the city and then specifically you alluded to it in answer to I think Councillor Johnson's question, the Fokorongo school barrier arm situation. Where are we on that safety upgrade? The James's line barrier arm that's currently so under yeah. construction. Yeah. So will be in place within weeks, I think. So I haven't physically visited the site, but those of you maybe in the area may have more up to date uh, intelligence. Um, and so how does the, thank you for that specific answer to that. Good to see that coming ahead. Um, how does the interaction with the, the rail network feed into this report? It's about transport, but we seem to be very much focused on the roading network and interaction with pedestrian and cycling, but obviously we do have a significant rail corridor through the city. So how does that link into this? So Kiwi Rail manage the safety risks around their rail network. And so they have a separate uh, funding prioritization line for um, upgrading of level crossings. Um, we obviously have been over the years uh, uh, applying to Kiwi Rail and the funding inevitably comes from NZTA, so it's an interesting triangulation. Uh, we apply for the for project, uh, we get approval for the um, NZTA funding um, support, but, NZ, uh, but Kiwi Rail pays none of it, okay? So we pay 50, we're 49% and, and NZTA pays the 51. So at this stage, uh, I, we don't have any other uh, um, crossing within the program. Uh, but there are a number of other rural roads which have uh, level crossings and, and we are looking to engage with NZTA to understand whether what their appetite is around improved signage and, and in some cases maybe road stopping. Um, we have one location where we're looking at possibly stopping the road so we don't have a crossing at all. So, um, but yeah, yeah, that's probably all I can say. So in terms of 2.3.2, .2, which is the safety audits list, can I just be assured that rail safety is also taken into account in that safety audit process? Yes, no, we, we certainly, it is part of our thinking, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. The GM would also like to comment. I think just in answer to the question, currently it doesn't. Right? And as we get more mature in this area, um, a, a great degree of reporting clarity, we, would, we should look to integrate it. 
thank you, councillors. Thank you, officers. Um, appreciate um, those responses. I'm happy to move the recommendations, both of them. One was recommending the dates for reporting. Um, do I have a seconder? Councillor Bowen, open it up for any comments or debate. Uh, perhaps I'll start for Johnson next. The report obviously brings a lot more questions than what uh, we have answers for at this stage. So um, we need to maybe look to channel some sort of report through planning the strategy, which I think um, become clear. The other one was around the data around the effect of change. Once we put in one or two treatments of safety improvements that are minor in most cases, uh, we can't expect to see a massive altering of, of the annual stats. And so understanding that um, is one of the impacts. And the other one that's come up around the prioritisation of what treatment should go next. We are in a political space and that Monrad intersection is certainly one that elevates it for priority um, in the item 4.2.2 where we still have projects that are relatively subjective, it says, and unduly influenced by external advocacy. And that's, that's because we're in a political environment. Um, and we understand that. So, um, and that's where uh, the greater noise might bring a lower priority project up for funding. So, um, I will just want to make those summary comments before I go to others. Councillor Johnson. Uh, thanks, Mr Chair. I just wanted to make some comments around the reduction in the budget for the minor safety uh, improvements. Um, now, two weeks ago, councillors, a majority of us voted to reduce this budget down from 833,000 for the next financial year, uh, 100,000, sorry, to 200,000. Now, that's a significant reduction. That budget uh, was completely spent the year before, and it's a programme that's constantly oversubscribed. And uh, to think that reducing it from 833 down to 200,000 isn't going to have a significant effect on our ability to carry out minor safety improvements in the next financial year is to be quite blinkered in, in what we're doing here. Um, it seemed to be relatively easy two weeks ago for some people to vote for massive cuts to the budget. But every time one of these cuts comes up, I'm going to bring your attention to it because they all have consequences. Mm. And this is the consequence is that this budget is now, uh, for this programme, is hugely reduced. Now, as a result, um, it's a little bit uh, bereft for this year, um, and we will be faced with situations where we're asked to make safety improvements and the budget isn't there. So either we have to refuse them, or we have to use the uh, euphemistically named prioritisation tool. Uh, and I think we've all had experience of prioritisation tools in the health a context, which basically means, uh, you know, if you need a hip replacement, you have to be pretty much unable to walk before you get one. I'm not quite sure what it means in terms of, of road safety, but uh, no doubt we will find out over the next coming year. So um, I just uh, want to register my very serious concern that we're underdone in this budget and that over the next year, we'll either be asked for more money for minor safety improvements or else they won't occur and the consequences of that uh, we have yet to see. Any other comments? Councillor Barrett. Uh, thank you, Mr Chair, and first to uh, thank the officers for a, a report that's very helpful, the level of integration, the level of forward looking, um, not just new councillors, even some of the recycled councillors. We really appreciate having this um, sort of information coming to hand and in my time on council, this is one of the more helpful transport reports that I've seen. So it's really, really great. It's always been a bit of an irony to me that, that we often find out more about our, our transport um, activities through our reporting to the regional transport committee than we do around this table. So it's it's brilliant to see it, brilliant to see it starting to show up here. Um, wanted to very much endorse what the chair was saying. The report does bring a heavy analytical lens to it and I think that's that's helpful but it is only the analytical lens and the reality is that transport, like everything else in this city, does have an element of advocacy, an element of you know, political um, 
uh, oversight and interest in it. And I think we do need to, to push back a bit on the sense that the numbers are going to tell us everything. I think we do have a role at this table to help set specific priorities in specific instances where there is uh, need that's expressed through political process. Um, it was really helpful to hear from the officers around some options looking ahead and understanding that some of that reporting might come into other committees. So I think rather than craft a recommendation on the fly here, what I do is just sort of flag my direction of thinking and we might use um, some offline work just to just to sort of test some of that out further. But two things that I'm thinking of, one is is something that we might call a, a pedestrian network improvement plan or something like that. I think it would be quite a nice complement to the urban cycle network development plan that we actually had a forward looking vision for pedestrian infrastructure safety experience in this city that we could share with and articulate to our constituents. I think it would fill a real gap. We have a lot of noise around footpaths and their state of repair, but actually the pedestrian system is much more than just the footpaths. It's the crossings. It's the, the, the lighting at night. It's a whole lot of things, and I'd like to really see us strongly articulate a vision for um, a, a quality pedestrian experience in, in the city. Um, and the second element that I comment on is I think that this has been a, a, an opportunity to see what's possible, I guess, in terms of insight into what's happening in the transport space. And, and I'm happy with the safety lens, but I would like to see us think about a broader, um, probably six monthly as well, sort of update just in terms of overall network capacity and overall network performance. I think it's really important to make sure that we see that overall picture of transport at some point. Um, at this table as well. And if we've got a, a tempo going here around safety reporting, it would seem that an overall um, network capacity, network performance type addition to that report might might be possible. So just leave those as comments at this point rather than um, driving towards the recommendation at this stage, but just wanted to flag my thinking to um, other elected members and staff. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Councillor Harper. That is a good report, but I do think that we do need to have a stronger emphasis on what we are saying as a council to NZTA in terms of the fatalities, in terms of what is happening on Napier Road. We do need to have a stronger voice. I mean, it was great to seeing a presentation on what they're doing at the Gorge, give them a clap, but what are we saying to them in terms of what is happening on Napier Road? It is where our deaths are occurring. It is we aren't doing enough and saying enough on Napier Road. We have had a number of deaths on Napier Road and what are we doing about it as a council? Because our community is getting angrier and angrier about it, particularly around Kelvin Grove. So I can sit and read a report, which is great, but I do think as a council, we need to be saying more. So thank you for the report. It's great, but we do need to say more. And we need to be angry about it because our community is angry about it. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Finlay. I totally agree with Councillor Harpeter. Um, the Napier Road problem has been there since, well, back in the 90s, basically. Um, it's never been addressed because every time we try to bring it up, the answer is it's NZTA and that's all we can do. Well, we had NZTA come along and talk to us today. Could we not approach NZTA and ask them if they could bring a deputation to this council, to this committee, and talk to talk to us about what is happening with Napier Road? Not the gorge, not anything else, just the Napier Road situation. Can we make that invitation or we'll send an invitation to NZTA? Can anyone tell me? Yeah, it's possible. The, I think that could be the answer, and we can get them here, we can grill them and ask the questions ourselves. Thank you. The Mayor. Thank you, Mr Chair. Agree with my colleagues, um, Councillor Harper and Councillor Finlay. Um, today we have a workshop, which um, unfortunately NZTA is scheduled on our council day. Um, so um, none of us can attend, but I might, have, I might, uh, I might uh, attend that um, on Zoom. Um, you're so right, councillors. Um, my understanding is um, there may need to be more deaths before that road is fixed. Um, it's not in the schedule for the next two years. 
and uh, we keep getting told we're just if it was on Auckland or Wellington, it may get fixed. But poor old Palmy is so underinvested by NZTA, and um, I know the officers are working hard, but we are limited unless we get really, really noisy, and I think we need to start to get noisy. Okay. Thank you. I'll uh, conclude the comment, and now I'll look. To, we'll put both recommendations together. All those in favour say aye. Aye. Against. Carried. We'll move through. Uh, actually, we might just break. Or we did in the notes say we might break for um, after one and a half hours, and we're almost there. Um, is it yeah, is 20 minutes long enough for everybody? If we can reconvene here then at 10 to, um, we'll adjourn until um, for a break. Thank you.
that's right. Councillors, can I just call on you to take your seats? We'll reconvene in a minute. need to adjust the sound we'll just do one more minute good we're good to go reconvene thank you councillors that brings us to item 10 which is our update on the three water asset condition and welcome Jono and Robert to present. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, morning to the Mayor, uh, Chair and Councillors. Um, yeah, look, uh, for those councillors that don't know me, I think the last time I presented the council was uh, the previous council term. So uh, my name is Jono ferguson Pye. I'm the Asset Planning Manager for those that don't know me. So um, thank you. Um, look, this report is an update report that was requested by councillors on the Three Waters Asset Condition. Um, I guess the reason why this report was requested is that there's been a, a number of sort of across uh, various TAs um, across the country, there's been uh, a series of sort of uh, three waters assets failures and, and councillors wanted us to report back on on the, the condition of our th three waters assets and give a, a, a summary and overview of the situation here in Palmerston North. I think some of the broad um, conclusions of the report is that, you know, the asset condition of the three waters um, assets is generally in good condition, but there are targeted areas that require additional investment to, to ensure long term uh, can, that the long term conditions maintain. So um, some of the I guess some of the key key uh, themes of the report uh, around asset condition data and, and how we need to improve in that area to make sure that we have that condition data to, to be able to optimise our renewals investments uh, moving forward. So just quickly touching on the wastewater uh, asset condition. So what we're talking about there is that the overall condition of the network is really sound. However, we have had, had, had some isolated truck main failures. Um, obviously, the wastewater treatment plant, uh, Robert, to this in the past, there's uh, additional required in that area, um, given resilience issue um, there that you know it's, it's the only site um, where we treat our wastewater in the city making sure it continues to be functional through the consent and the ultimate construction video process critical. Um, we have some uh, wet weather network capacity issue or constraints in the wastewater system um, and there's some various backlog uh, and water pump station renewals as well that um, that we'll need to re address in the next LTP. Um, and it'll, some of those renewals relate to sort of sewer mains and pump stations. So that's sort of the target area, targeted areas we need to look at in terms of, of wastewater. With uh, the water supply network, in terms of the pipelines, the reports have talks about our pipelines generally being good Good condition. Um, there are some sort of targeted areas that we need to need to keep working on. So, the cast iron pipelines. We've had um, this coloration of water in the past. We're, we're fair way through that um, program now, and um, we're getting good results there. Um, we have a backlog in the asbestos um, cement pipe renewals, which we will come to you with a program to address that, that issue um, for the next LTP. And then I guess the other area that we need to be aware of is the ashes rising main. Um, I guess stage one and two of that that uh, rising main replacement um, will be completed this year. So that is a, an area of the network which was vulnerable, which um, I think we're making good progress in, in um, dealing with that. Just sticking with the water supply network, um, looking at the bores and, and our requirements in the future around uh, water compliance. So we know that um, over the, the next 15 to 20 years, there'll be a, a slow decline in, in the yield of those bores. Um, and that also will need to upgrade the sto uh, storage and treatment facilities uh, to comply with you know, legislative obligations in that area as well. Um, and additional boards will be required to address resilience and to respond to growth. Uh, a classic example around um, resilience and growth in that area is 
the railway road bore, which you know deals with growth as well as sort of contributing to to, to better resilience in the network in the, the Kelvin Grove area. So the water treatment plant uh, for water, there's a multi-year seismic uh, program in place for, for the treat, water treatment plant, and we're currently just developing a program um, for the water treatment plant, looking at the future dr uh, drinking water standards to, to make sure that we're up and dressed when there's a requirement for us to, to upgrade that, that piece of plant. In terms of the Turatea uh, catchment, um, there's no immediate supply issues, but we know long term that the sustainable yield of the um, Turatea catchment will decline slowly as we get um, drier summers. Um, so, you know, in the long term, we know we're going to have a, 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 an increased reliance on, on bore supplies for the city. So um, when we're going to need to, to build redundancy and resilience across the city bores um, over the sort of medium to long term um, with respect to water supply. When we look at, I guess, specific network issues uh, for water, um, we know that some of our condition information indicates that valves, tobies and backflow devices are in poor condition. And I think Robert sort of alluded to this in the past as well. You know, we've had, this has resulted in a 100% increase in reactor maintenance. So we will be coming to you with a program for renewals in this area to, to move this forward. Um, I guess if we don't renew, you know, our assets when we need to, then there's that corresponding increase in cost in terms of, you know, reactive maintenance and, 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 and having to, to deal with things as they crop up. The stormwater network, um, this is an interesting one, stormwater. Um, I think one of the councillors I can remember to, uh, talking about stormwater is the poor cousin in the um, in the in the work the councillor workshops for the LTP. Um, so our 2017 AMP noted that you know our stormwater network was in good condition, but you actually read that AMP, it said that it's based on assumed uh, rates of deterioration. So actually, we don't have a lot of good condition data in terms of the stormwater network. Um, we know that the performance of the primary network uh, varies widely across the city. Um, you know, we're getting more intensive rainfall with climate change, and we're getting more infill development, which you know increases in previous surfaces, uh, and that leads to an impact on the network performance and resilience. Um, and you know, uh, when that happens, we, we have secondary drainage pathways that we're having to rely on more often. So we're getting streets and um, those sorts of areas are more frequently inundated stormwater when we get heavy heavy rainfall events. So in terms of stormwater, we we talked in I think in the in the workshop about a targeted upgrade of the stormwater network. So that was sort of targeting specific localized ponding and flooding issues. Um, and a sort of a citywide multi-year program which has been developed for the LTP to deal with to deal with that issue that has been discussed. I guess also in the stormwater network, there's older components of the network where um, we haven't got asset condition, and but you know some failures are uh, just indicating that that more work um, around renewals will be required in the older parts of the stormwater network. The other part of the stormwater network we we know we're going to have to spend a little bit of money on moving forward. Um, I guess is the stormwater pump station. So. Post our 2017 amps, um, our further work indicated that many of our pump stations aren't fit for purpose. Um, that additional capital investment will re require to, to upgrade um, these these um, pump stations. But again, we're going to need to get some better condition data to, to inform that renewals program. Just touching on the next part of the report that talks about the asset management maturity assessment. So the asset planning division um, to try and target our work program heading into the LTP commissioned an independent asset maturity assessment just to see, you know, what were our strengths and weaknesses in terms of our asset management practice across the organisation. So some of the key findings that came out of that um, independent report in the Three Waters area, again, was this lack of understanding of condition and, and capacity. Um, so, you know, one of the key um, areas that we need to work on is looking at programs so we can better understand our asset condition data, or the condition of our, our, our um, networks and making sure we have, um, I guess, robust programs to, to get that data um, and, and make sure we've got processes in place to ensure that we can do that. So that, that's a big focus that, that came out of the maturity assessment, um, which will feed into to the asset planning division's work program moving forward. I guess in, in terms of trying to, to sort of 
respond to some of these issues um, across the three waters and try and sort of target investment so that we're, you know, we're, we're investing in areas that are needed. Um, the strategic asset management plan sort of sets a high, some high level direction um, for our asset managers in terms of where we need to be targeting um, our efforts in the three waters asset management plans. And three waters asset management plans, um, for those councillors who haven't been through an LTP, at the end of them actually have an asset improvement um, plan in them with, with tasks that need to be um, carried out um, to improve asset management practice. So these, these issues that we're facing will be in those improvement plans as actions to actually respond to um, uh, uh, in the work program that the asset planning division will be um, um, moving forward next year. I guess the other thing there also is the actions and the issues that are in this paper also reflected in the program of works that we will be will be developing to support the LTP. So obviously it's important that you know these um, these targeted areas that we need to look at um, that we uh, that we develop programs um, to to present to you as part of the LTP process for you to consider. Um, I guess the other thing that I would like to talk about is that post LTP, um, the asset planning division, you know, we're, we're, we're busy at the moment developing asset management plans, working with activity managers to develop the program of works um, and in developing asset management improvement programs. And post LTP, my team will be really looking at then looking at the asset improvement plan tasks and driving those. In the past, it's probably fair to say, and I had a report um, to council last year about this, how we hadn't sort of um, progressed those asset management plan actions um, as we should have. I think now that we've got a targeted team, which actually is is not in the business, it's away from the operational part of the business, we'll be able to drive those improvement items, ensure that these, these issues that have been highlighted in this report uh, are dealt with. So in terms of the program of works, we are currently uh, Looking at a number of programs around um, around uh, better condition assessment, so we're developing a new program for stormwater and for water, which we'll present to you. And we're currently developing uh, two programs for the wastewater um, area. Um, it's, a, it's a bigger area with, with probably slightly bigger issues, targeted at, at wastewater facilities, and then the other program is targeted at, at pipe, pipeline condition assessments and trying to get more information. I guess the key. Um, message here is that is that we to make informed evidence-based decision make, making in the future for our renewals we need good condition data and in the past I think council officers have struggled to sort of tell you that story about okay well we need renewals we need renewals but well, why do we need renewals I think with better condition data and, and programs in place to get that then we'll be able to tell you that story and, and and explain why these you know why there, there needs to be spending in these areas. So, um, yep. Thank you. Thank you. Open up to questions, Councillor Harper to lead us off, and then Councillor Johnson. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Thanks very much, John. Um, just really interested in the stormwater, and looking at pages fifty four, uh, three nineteen, three twenty, and three twenty two. Have you got any, got any preliminary figures around the costings of what you think those will be, or is that sort of what going to be for the LTP? Yeah, I think it's probably fair to say that um, we, we're doing some work on that at the moment, but we're at the very preliminary stages of that. Um, one of the things that we, we, we want to improve on through um, the development of the programme of works is sort of optioneering. And, in the past, we've been very quick to, to, to jump to a, a solution and say to you, well, this is what's needed and this is what it costs. So I guess what we're doing this time is we're, we're rather than jumping straight to a, um, I guess, a solution for this, we're sort of asking asset managers to go away and just look at the options. Um, so no, I can't give you an answer to that, sorry. No, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Johnson. Thanks, Mr Chair. Um, thanks, Jono and Robert. A um, couple of questions about the water supply. So in 3.12, um, you mentioned that because we don't have storage at the bore sites, we're not getting the recommended residual chlorine levels. And um, I think we've been told this before, uh, but the information that we've had before is that um, despite that, uh, that there was no risk of a contaminated water supply. Can you confirm that that's still the case? We believe that <clears throat> the current levels of um, 
free of volatile chlorine, coupled with the um, um, disinfection byproducts, it still gives us, you know, reasonable levels of com comfort that uh, you know we we have a contaminant a, a network that will not, um, you know, does not, um, you know, have excessive contamination risk. However, we do not meet the recommended drinking water standards level of FAC. So at the moment, uh, and I'll, there'll be a separate report coming um, next week to planning and strategy where I talk about the changes in the drinking water standards and compliance. So at the moment, the option still sits with us as the drinking water supplier. Um, in future, that option will be taken away from us. So in order to comply, we will be required to meet those sorts of standards. Okay, so um, is the proposed solution to have storage of water at the bore site so that it can be treated in place? Yes, the, the first site that's um, it has this integrated bore, uh, bore site facility is the railway road bore. So there's a combination of reservoir um, for contact time, uh, separate chemical treatment and, and dosing, and also separate pumping. So the arrangement is you the bore pumps into the, the reservoir, it, it's treated, and then essentially we have separate booster pumping coming out of the reservoir. So there's a there are a combination of objectives being achieved with those um, those upgrades. So there's both some resilience, there's water quality benefits, but there's also um, optimizing the investment in bore capacity. So we can actually service more people for the for the bore because we now have this peak storage. So now, yeah. and we will roll that out now across the the other um, bore stations within the city. Okay, so that'll be coming to us in the LTP, will it? That program? There's already a program which right. is approved. So, okay. and, and we'll be looking at revising that and just confirming that it has sufficient budget to continue that rollout across the city. Okay, so that will be starting this financial year. Well, we're already underway yeah. because we've started with Railway Road. So, obviously, but it's sort of retrofitting the other. Yes, things. that's yeah. right. Yeah, it's okay. ongoing. Good, thank you. And then regarding um, 3.16 about the um, network issues and the condition of the valves and tobies. So the current rate of renewal is investment replacement of the 9,000 tobies, which have no manifold or backflow, will take 25 to 30 years. Um, in terms of the uh, risk there, you say that this represents a significant contamination, security and reliability risk. So what is the time frame that you think it would be reasonable to replace these in? Again, um, I'll allude to that next week. Um, one of the key concerns with uh, you know the new approach to water safety is actually that you take every possible opportunity to eliminate the risk of contamination. So it's not about simply treating a bug once it's got into the network, it's actually preventing from getting in there. So anywhere in the network where you can get uh, backflow or, or contamination is clearly an, a, an opportunity for change. So Currently, the choice around the rate at which we address these risks sits with the water, the drinking, the water supply um, authority. So, in the future, these will become part of the mandated uh, obligations under a water safety plan. So, I don't know what that time frame is, but certainly it's a negotiated, um, you know, time frame. Uh, but we need to show. Uh, that we, as a as an authority or as a supplier, we're committed to addressing that risk within a reasonable time frame. So, um, I'd posit to suggest we, we'll be coming to you with something you know closer to you know five to five to eight years rather than twenty five to thirty years. Um, but you know that is a that will still be a decision for for council to make. Um. So just. Last question, Mr. Chair. Sure. Um, so just to make sure that I've understood correctly, what you're saying is at the moment, the treatment of the water should neutralize any contamination that might get in through these uh, lack of backflow devices, but that it's not sufficient, it's not considered sufficient to rely on that. Is that right? That's right. We're, yeah. we're moving to what's called a multi-barrier um, approach, uh, you know, a comprehensive approach where we try and stop them getting in the first place, but even if a few get in, we still have the adequate levels of treatment. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Petronas. Uh, thank you, Mr Chair. 
And thank you very much for your report. Um, query in respect of 3.12, is the railway road bore operational? Uh, not at this stage. We're just in the final contract um, implementation, which is the treatment and um, uh, control building. So that's uh, currently being tendered. So we are looking to get that underway and, you know, very soon and have that completed this calendar year. So a second follow up on that particular bore, um, there was to be um, a water main laid from that bore through to Bunnythorpe. Uh, is it going to be impacted by the Kiwi Rail hub that's being proposed? We still do not have any confirmation about the uh, preferred site for the Kiwi Rail um, freight hub. So, and we certainly don't understand what the impact will be on existing services. But um, yeah, potentially we may need to modify the route if there is a is a conflict with that development. But no, no knowledge of that at this stage. Right. The second question, Mr. Chair, um, 3.13, the Turatia Dam. Could you just explain what this following statement means? While there is residual uncertainty in respect of the upper dam's performance, what do you mean by that? Yeah, this is a reasonably complex area, and, and I, I mean, we're intending to bring a report with the latest work we've done in that area, but essentially we've done a modelling or a seismic modelling exercise on the dam. Um, we have uh, limited physical condition information on the uh, quality of the concrete, um, so we have to make assumptions. So using fairly conservative assumptions, i.e. assuming fairly average concrete strength, um, you know, there does appear to be a slight risk, you know, in, in the design earthquake of the dam failing. So um, we were looking to try to get rid of that risk uncertainty by doing sampling, but it's actually too difficult. We can't find a contractor to actually drill holes, <laughs> drill cores in the face of the dam. So at this stage, we're comfortable with the level of uncertainty and we'll be coming to you with our proposed um, approach to you know, um, you know, mitigating that risk for affected parties. Yeah. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Councillor Barrett. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, gentlemen, for the report. A uh, couple questions. First one's around stormwater, and during the recent um, annual budget hearings, we had um, the topic of minimum permeable area raised in our consciousness by by one of the submitters. And as I understand it, that's saying that on a residential section, you'd set aside a certain percentage of it as grass or garden or whatever, rather than than hard surface, and just wondering whether in your assessment in terms of our overall stormwater response we should be considering minimum permeable areas as a way of reducing some of the pressure on the system it, it's certainly one of the options um, we we've been doing some work around developing what we call a stormwater framework which is actually looking at every catchment subcatchment within the city and understanding what the challenges are in each catchment. Um, so in, in some catchments, we are particularly challenged around the capacity of the existing primary and secondary network. So it is, it is possible in those areas we should be looking at those sorts of controls, but there are likely to be other catchments where those, um, those benefits may not be present. So Yes, it's one of the toolbox um, options, but it may not be required in all cases. So we have yet to sort of clarify or discuss more widely as at a planning level whether that instrument is required. It would need to come in fairly well up in the hierarchy of planning instruments, um, possibly in you know district plan level or just below in order for it to be implementable. Um, Great, thanks. Um, the other question that um, comes to mind builds on Councillor Petrinas's questions about the, the Teratia Dam and the, the, the low probability but existing risk there. And just wanted to understand what, if anything, we're doing working with residents that would be impacted by a catastrophic failure to provide them with awareness and potential solutions around that. Yeah, as I said, we would we will come to council with a proposed mitigation um, plan around uh, the management of those residual risks, um, and uh, that would include yeah, options around 
early warning, uh, you know, safe exits, uh, controls on any further development within the uh, uh, the, the at-risk zone. Um, but yes, I mean, just to reiterate, it's a very, very low likelihood, but a significant, if not serious, consequence. So it still is a, a measurable risk that we need to take into account. Um, but no, uh, we will we'll be separately coming with uh, uh, a plan and of uh, around how to mitigate that risk. Thanks. So just so that I can be clear, then as of today, we we aren't actually doing anything with with those residents. No, not at this stage. Thank um, you. But we will certainly. It's it's a priority to to implement. I mean, we were poised before lockdown to begin a process with with council around that, but it's been delayed somewhat. So. Okay. Thank you. Thank Mr. you. Chair. Any further questions? No. Oh, sorry, yeah, Councillor Beatty. Sorry. Yep. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Jono. Uh, jo one question: um, the good condition data. Have you got um, sufficient budget, and when will you have all the data that you need so that we can start looking at the monies that's going to be required? Um, it's, uh, it's probably fair to say that. Um, I guess there's a, a num number of elements in responding to that question. Um, having sufficient condition data is sort of it's it's a bit it's a it's a big boat to turn around. So it, it's going to be a multi-year sort of approach to try and get to where we need to go. I mean, the first part of our approach is that if you look at previous amps around data uh, and, and condition data in particular, you know we've said, well, hey, you know we've got good data, we've got good knowledge of our assets. And what that what that really meant was we have all the assets in our database and we understand what we've got. But what we haven't been doing actually taking that data and actually analysing it and turning it into good information to inform our decision making. So the first step for us is to is to um, in our asset information team is to take is is to take that approach and, and make the best of what we've got. The second approach is, is to come to you via the LTP with these four programs that looks at increasing um, budget and, and increasing our capability in this area. And I guess the big thing there is that if we put some investment in the front end of the process, you know, we, we're likely to get some some benefit at the back end when it comes to us making better informed renewals decisions and optimising that investment in the future. Uh, and that, I guess that's the that, that's the longer term part of the process, and and that's not something you know. Asset condition data is data you know you, you collect it over time, and it tells you a story over time. So that's a slightly um, sort of uh, more longer focus um, response to that question. So just to follow up, by the time we start making LTP decisions, will we have? Will you be confident that the data that you've got is su sufficient to make the budget? Recommendation. I think it'll be sufficient to make the the, the budget recommendations, um, but I guess long term, um, I guess it's sufficient in the short term. Yeah. But in the longer term, you know, when we're talking about asset life and life cycle of assets, we're talking you know 50, 100 years. So um, I would say yes in in the short term for this LTP. In terms of our longer term confidence and condition and, and the way we're investing in, in, in renewals, um, yeah, that's a whole different story. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Just checking no further questions, councillors. Thank you. Thank you, officers. Appreciate um, the, the response to questions. I'm happy to move the recommendations. Seconded Councillor Petrinus. Open it up for any comment or debate. Councillor Beatty. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm really pleased that we've got a um, targeted management planning team for this. This is something that we've lacked for many years and to have a total focus around, I mean, these are our core assets and, and not having this information to hand to prepare budgets and tick things off, I think is, um, you know, I think we've made some poor decisions in the past through having that lack of data. So I'm looking forward to that, but I think we've got to be prepared that when some of, I mean, when you start looking at some of the issues in in this report about the fact that we've made, you know, um, assumptions around our renewals, which some of them are behind, you've got, um, as I say, not knowing too much about what's going on under there, is that we're going to have to be prepared that when this LTP comes out, 
that we start preparing for it, I think that we're going to get some surprises. Mm -hmm. So I would just like, you know, and we've got to make sure this is our core business. It's like Councillor Johnson was saying in our last session, safety on roads and things like this. We cannot just move and defer and because we've got other priorities. And I think we need to make these ones our first priority. So thank you. Thank you. I'll echo those comments of yours, Councillor Beatty, and in fact, having this information team has been vital. Um, in the past, we've been found out, uh, and, and it'd be fair to say we've been underfunding our renewals of our significant assets, uh, not only in water, but also in our uh, roading uh, footpath um, space, um, and potentially in our property when we start to find out more about uh, the needs around what's required financially. So the more information we can get before the long-term plan, the better, but I understand this is gonna take a multi-year approach, which has been referenced uh, to get the information. Uh, concur that this infrastructure is significant. We've got, I think, the asset budget of council is over 1.6 billion or, or thereabouts. Um, so significant uh, responsibility to make sure that we maintain that well. Uh, and make sure it performs. And the point around surprises, we may get surprises, but it's better to have this team working through, bringing the information as it comes to hand, uh, in that let's be informed and make good decision space um, is important. So any other comments before we um, move to vote? Councillor Barrett. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Just briefly to build on Councillor Beatty's comment, which I thought was spot on, we are going to get some surprises and it's fantastic to know that there's actually going to be some some good data that's going to inform those those requests coming to us. But I would, I guess, add to that by saying I think we yes we need to be prepared that there may be some budgetary um, surprises coming, some some challenges coming in the budgetary space on this. But I think as a council we also need to be prepared to look at the other options that are in the toolbox, things that do sit in in the regulatory space and that and that does take some political appetite to actually deploy. But you know we should be prepared to act when there's opportunities around water conservation, when there's opportunities around stormwater attenuation on property. Those are ways that we can actually minimize the impact on the ratepayer and actually improve the amenity of the city. So there's a win-win there. It does take political appetite and it should be sitting in parallel with the, the budgetary um, response. Yeah, thank you, Councillor. I, I have support for your um, comments as well and the fact that when we're looking at a city developing for growth, that we're having a lot of infill and for water retention as being a perfect example where we can share the responsibilities around um, the outcome of managing that issue around stormwater um, effectively, but have an environmental outcome at the same time. No further comments, going to put all those in favour say aye. 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 Against, that's carried. We're moving now to the work schedule. Um, is there an officer or manager that the summary? Otherwise, otherwise I can ask for questions if there are any questions. Yeah, I'll take it as read. I'm happy to move it as an update. And Slipiety. Any points, query? There being none, I'll put the vote. All those in favour say aye. aye. Against, carried. That moves us into the recommendation to move into part two. Uh, and that is for the item 13, Streets for People program and the procurement of design services um, and the reason being commercial activity. Um, I'm happy to move that we move into part two. Look for a seconder. Councillor Beatty, any Comment, debate, put that recommendation. All those in favour say aye. Aye. Against, that's carried. We'll just pause for a couple of minutes while we make sure that the access to um, 